Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, join Roger Welsh for a taste of the plains. First course, homemade soup. It's the hottest small town competition all year, where neighbor battles neighbor for the crown of best soup chef. With winter comes jerky season. That's when the men of Dannebrog, Nebraska take over a kitchen and get together to cook up their favorite beef jerky recipes. Plus, there's more to corn than meets the cob. Find out how Nebraska's versatile ag product led to a mountain of success for one farmer. And finally, eating out in the plains means more than meat and potatoes. These days, the old reliable steakhouse has got company from around the world. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. They say that competition is an inherent part of the human spirit. The Olympics, the Super Bowl, the Battle of the Bands. Well, last month here in Dannebrog, there was a chili soup contest up at Eric's Tavern. And tonight, tonight, it's potato soup. Carrie, are these all the potatoes you got left? Yep, that's the only bag. Holy smoke, don't you know there's a potato soup contest in town tonight? Well, maybe that's why I don't have any. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Dee is a waitress at the local cafe. You make sure they're okay. Yeah, I think they'll be all right. All right. Are you going to have this ready by 6 o'clock? Oh, you bet. No problem. Sue is a school bus driver. Are you pretty nervous about tonight's contest? It means no. Let's be nervous about cooking. Caroline is a local artist. Any secret ingredients that you can't tell me about? <laughs> Very definitely. <laughs> about the only ingredient all the cooks agree on is potatoes. Everything else is up for grabs. Curious and Harriet wants to put a little broccoli in this one, so. No one knows exactly how this whole thing came about. They used to have potluck dinners now and then at the local tavern. Then something happened. My theory is that it was innocent enough. Someone said something about how good Dee's vegetable soup was. And then someone else said, yeah, but he preferred Dave's chili. And then maybe somebody complained that Dave's chili, as good as it is, never has enough beans in it. And then someone else said, well, real chili doesn't have beans in it anyway. And so began the Dannebrog Tavern's irregular soup challenge. And now, nobody just eats anymore. They discuss, they argue, they judge. Linda bet me that no one would show up. Chili, she says, is a standard for soup contests. So sure, there were six entries for the chili contest, but potato soup? What can you do with potato soup? Linda's secret ingredients, between you and me, are mashed potatoes and my home cured bacon. Sue, the bus driver's, is cheese. All right. Dee and Harriet from the cafe add homemade noodles to theirs. Well, well we think ours is the best. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? Six kettles of soup, just as many entries as we had chili night. Do I get to vote? Sure, everybody gets to vote. Mm. It's all a fraud just to get soup anyway. It's you know pretty that? good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this one's got beans in it. That yeah. looks like bean soup. No, it's potatoes. How can you tell? It's got beans in it. Well, you can tell that because there's a tater in there. <laughs> You're not supposed to know that. The steaming pots are unidentified, but in a town of 320 people, soup kettles are as recognizable as cars or children. What happened to your entry, Wendy? I thought you were going to make some. I did. <laughs> oh, did you? Oh, is it here? And I'm not telling you I'm in the awkward position of having to judge this competition. Awkward because one of the entries is my wife's. This is going to require some diplomacy. How did she cheat? You cheated, though. You put beans in yours. We all had secret ingredients. Yeah. She puts beans. She puts beans. She puts beans. She puts beans. Well, you're supposed to put bacon. If the cooks have their secrets, so does their audience. Wonder where they got their Only rank amateurs fill up their bowls at the first kettle they approach. 
As when tasting wines, the wise taster resists temptation, torturing and teasing his palate with dibs and dabs, returning again and again to the array of soup pots. And we got all kinds of stuff here. There'll be time later for gorging. I just started on number one, and I'm going to work my way through all of them. <laughs> Empty bowls. You better get some more. Empty bowls. We're judging on leftovers, too. You leave over, that person loses. A lot of postcard regulars showed up for the soup challenge. This is going to be so hard. Renee Van Winkle is the mother of Corey, the young Marine we followed to the Gulf and back. Dan the plumber never misses a chance for a dish of free soup. Harriet and Dee, professional cooks, teamed up to produce one of the contest's favorites. Broccoli, broccoli in, in this one is really good. Eric is a proprietor of the town's tavern. Some of the best clam chowder I've had. He's a Republican, so he spells potato with an E. He knows how to spell potato, he just wants to make a point. What's wrong with those clams, I'll tell you that. I gotta go through all six. <laughs> the real job of the judge is to lend an air of officiality to the evening's fun. I don't know, you guys. You're not holding up as well as the people back there in the back booth. They've tried all six. The tough part of the task is to come up with a decision at the end of the evening. Results are tabulated and announced to satisfy that insatiable drive for finality. Okay, we have the winners after some careful calculations. But debate continues until the kettles are scraped clean. Three. The second prize winner was number four. Another yeah, successful soup competition at the Danabrog Tavern. I told you we should have numbers <laughs> on our backs and on our pots. And they say nothing goes on in little towns. Up next on Postcards from Nebraska, usually in the dark of winter, when there's snow on the ground, men gather in small groups to prepare food. Not meals, but with a male philosophy that anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Recipes requiring whole animals at a time. Men who usually talk about brands of beer or trade tractor parts spend long hours considering seasonings, flavorings, and smoking style. I like to consider myself something of a cook, although most of my culinary efforts take place out here in my summer kitchen with a maximum of smoke, heat, and laundry disasters. My circumstances out here, my wife Linda tells me, have a lot to do with the fact that every time I cook inside the house, she has to repaint the kitchen. But out here, I'm free to explore my culinary exuberance without restraint. That's American tradition. Men cook outside the house over fire. But around here, there's an exception. Cayenne down, the Cajun down, the salt and pepper. What, what does your wife think about you using her spices like this? Seeing her spices, these are mine. I got my own cupboard. Usually in the dark of winter, when there's snow on the ground, men gather in small groups to prepare food. Not meals, but with a male philosophy that anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Recipes requiring whole animals at a time. Where now you can take your, your venison in the fall or any meat, your goose, anything, and then uh, uh, bone it out, cut out the fat, keep the lean meat, grind it up, store it in pre-weighed packages so you know what you need for a certain amount of uh, seasoning. There's two pounds. Melvin. It's jerky season in Nebraska. We're in my pal Dan Seldon's kitchen, not far from Danabrog, with some buddies, Bondo, Mel, Marty, making jerky. I was asking these guys, Marty, does your wife care when you borrow her dehydrator like this? No, she doesn't. Don't tell her. <laughs> this is ground habaneros and onions and a whole bunch of other stuff. Nah, we better put a little more. Nah, that's all right. Men who usually talk about brands of beer, relative merits of football teams, or trade tractor parts, spend long hours considering seasonings, Here's some of the good hot peppers, flavorings, this is a uh, jerk seasoning, drying techniques. If you like it, like it kind of chewy, or if you like it 
jerky jerky i i like it done and smoking styles why why is melvin mixing up one batch over there and you're mixing up a batch here that's his batch this is my batch it's his recipe this is my recipe <laughs> That smells good already. Oh, it's terrific. You get, wow. Once it gets warm and starts cooking, it'll just be candy. Mmm, boy. Boy, that's hot. You smell the heat off that stuff. Mm. Right, bye. They taste the ragged, brownish black meat tatters as if they were sampling fine wines. You must taste it's the salt a little bit hotter. Okay. They do comparisons, discuss vintages and nuances, presentation and afterglow. That's a little bit of pepper in that, baby. <laughs> wow. You can taste uh, Larry Obermiller's jerky or somebody else's jerky and know that it was theirs. Oh, some somewhat that way. But some people get a little more hair in it than others. <laughs> How long will this stuff keep? Dan, you... Depends you, on where you take it. Yeah, depends on who, who knows about it, you know. You can... Do you take it to Dan or to the Eric's? They don't keep, keep very about, long at all. Keep about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> what you doing? Pickup trucks crisscross the naked plains with little plastic bags of samplings. The chef's asking only for a nod of approval, perhaps a favorable comparison with the product of another of the local jerky makers. Try some of this. Baggies are tossed onto tavern tables almost in defiance. Taste this. Is it the best you've ever had or not? Is it, is it beef? Mm -hmm. Maybe the male attraction to what is essentially dried raw meat is that it persists today as tavern food. It is therefore associated with good times, good friends, and laughter. I'm thinking of blind Linda likes jerky. A lot of women do. And there are even a few women around here who make jerky. Yeah. You sprinkle pepper on it when you got no it in the soy sauce. Mm -hmm. No soy sauce, but you you sprinkle some pepper on it when you got it in the trays. But this is a predominantly male exercise that has deep-seated meanings and primal origins. A lot of times the first old bash doesn't even make it to the baggies. Uh -huh. The first two three. Oh yeah. Go you know what comes out. Grab a spool and go. And everybody walk in the door and you know you're making jerky that day. Women seem to accept exile from their own kitchens for this season when men prepare food not for the table, but for the pocket. Perhaps they figure it's basically harmless, and in a few days the kitchen will be theirs again. You can make jerky out of about anything. It, it, <clears throat> I, I know you can make it out of skunk. They never know. <laughs> I, I know none of you guys would ever do this, but have you ever heard of anybody using roadkill for jerky? Oh, he always start with a little road kill. <laughs> and then you can always say, yeah, it gets better as you go. <laughs> I like rituals like this. They give texture no to the problem, year. Dan. I especially like the idea of men becoming experts in the kitchen, at home, where they're usually forbidden, and doing things that they would normally disdain as woman's work. Besides, I've gained something of a reputation as a gourmet in such matters. And with any luck at all, I'll be chewing on sample packages of elk, beef, venison, goose, bear, well into the next jerky season. When Postcards from Nebraska returns, it isn't easy to find corn cobs anymore. But recently, while driving down the highway from Danabrog, I found a new source, this mountain of cobs on the farm of Patty and Brian Dreaver. I've lived in Nebraska, the Cornhusker state, all my life. So I thought I knew just about everything there is to know about corn. There's sweet corn for eating off the cob and popcorn. Most Nebraska corn is field corn like this, used to feed hogs, cattle, and poultry, to make soft drinks and beer, to make fuel for our automobiles. Pretty versatile stuff, corn. Every year I smoke hams for our family larder and for Christmas gifts. My secret recipe requires the smoke of applewood and corn cobs.
over the years, that's gotten to be a bit of a problem for me. It isn't easy to find corn cobs anymore. But recently, while driving down the highway from Danabrog, I found a new source, this mountain of cobs on the farm of Patty and Brian Drever. It turns out the Drever farm is just the gathering place for all these cobs. Eventually, they'll be shipped to a processing plant where they're used to make an even wider variety of products than the kernels themselves. They're going to make chemicals out of it, and uh, they're going to make an absorbents and just different, a lot of different things. But for the moment, here they are, more and more of them every week. Didn't know that there was this much use for cows. We've been throwing them on the ground for quite a few years. Brian Drever says his place with its Cobb Mountain has become something of a curiosity. A lot of old timers come back for school reunion or something and they just drive by real slow four or five times and can't believe what they're seeing. Just make the sweetest smoke you can imagine. Patty Drever was kind enough to let me take a couple of bags home to smoke next year's hams. Okay, great. You wouldn't know it from this pile, but cobs are scarce. That's because modern corn pickers chew them up and throw them out the back of the machine, back onto the field where they grew. And the story doesn't end there. Is there any sign that farmers are changing their farming practices so that they can start saving the cobs instead of just throwing them back on the fields? Well, we, we've tried to encourage that through some programs we've had, but uh, most of them uh, still are going to use a combine. I think they John Curran has helped manage this cob processing plant in Omaha most of his career. What we want is really in this inner rim there. The, the sugars that we're after are really in this, this area down here below. What we call it. Turns out, I knew nothing about the versatility of corn, especially of its valuable byproduct, the lowly cob. Everything from kitty litter uses cobs somewhere along the line. Inline skates, automobile engines, smokestacks, biker shorts, insecticides, plywood, all use cobs. If you're a skier, it's uh, probably you know, the principal component of your ski boots. Uh, it probably goes into your golf, uh, golf uh, ball covers and uh, molds for things like engine blocks or large valves in manufacturing. Um, they still use to refine lube oils. And um, so there are a lot of different uses today, uh, pretty widespread from pharmaceuticals to heavy industry. So when we put on our, our spandex biking shorts, pull on our inline wheels, jump in the car, and take an aspirin for afterwards when we're sore, all of those things could very well have come out of this pile. That's true. They all originate uh, from the, the sugar chemicals that come out of the corn cobs. And in fact, while there continues to be a glut of corn with low prices and not nearly enough storage to protect it or rail cars to move it, there's a shortage of cobs, and they sell at a premium. Is there anything at all out of the, the cob that winds up being just totally useless? Uh, not that I know of, because we use the whole thing. After we extract the liquid chemicals from it, we dump the solids that are left, which looks and smells a little bit like coffee grounds, and that's the only fuel we burn in our boiler. And um, after we burn the fuel, it leaves some ash, of course, and we collect that ash, and we either put that back on the fields, uh, or it can be used in other uses. Uh, and ultimately, whatever's left winds back on the field to grow more corn. Uh, that's the way we like to see it, <laughs> and it works that way. I used to wonder what they were going to do with all this corn that carpets Nebraska from one end to the other. Now I wonder what it is they can't do with all this corn. Still to come on Postcards from Nebraska. Cosmopolitan cuisine is in. Now, even within easy driving distance of my little village of Danabrog, we can go to Nona's Palazzo, the Yen Ching or Peking Palace, La Esquina or Dos Hermanos. There are even Oriental grocery stores. When I was a kid, 40 years ago, I heard there was a Chinese restaurant in Omaha, 
but it might just as well have been in Beijing. At my family's table, we ate meat and potatoes, white bread and apple pie. We ate American food, never Chinese or Mexican or Greek. This is fasulada. It's a Greek soup. I have northern beans, carrots, celery, onion. Ethnic restaurants survived primarily to service their own communities. This is really good soup. My daughter Joyce, a young professional, told me the other day that when she and her friends talk about going out for a meal, they don't ask where shall we eat, but what shall we eat? Mexican, Italian, Greek, Thai, Chinese. Style is kind of spicy hot with uh, um, more strong flavors. The Szechuan style is spicy hot, but it's a little bit sweet taste. That's the difference. Americans are no longer embarrassed by their ethnicity, even out here on the plains, where social movements arrive slowly, if at all. More importantly. Increasingly, it's not just okay for me to be German, it's okay for you to be Chinese or Mexican or Greek. How did you get them started on something like yours? They don't, they you don't know, you know like me. Hey, come on, try some of that soup, make you feel good. And that's it. And then it's just a, people really take a chance, you know, and try it and, and they like it. The Plains at one time had a patchwork geography of which echoes remain. Farwell, Nebraska was once Posen, and its Polish origins are still apparent. And then the Danes came to dominate, and they bid farewell, farewell to Posen. And here, within sight of Farwell, is the Czechoslovakia Cemetery. But that was all long ago, and soon everyone wanted to be not Polish or Danish, or Czech, but American, 200% American. My family's German through and through, but during the 1940s, we didn't eat sauerkraut, we ate victory cabbage. And when we had runzes, my people's soul food, we called them hand grenades. The times have changed. Cosmopolitan cuisine is in. Now, even within easy driving distance of my little village of Danabrog, we can go to Nona's Palazzo, the Yen Ching or Peking Palace, La Esquina or Dos Hermanos. There are even Oriental grocery stores. <laughs> Down the road from Danabrog at Cairo, Streets bear names like Suez, Nile, and Said, dreams of frontier glory. And now you can get souvlaki and gyros at Tony's Diner, gifts of modern immigration. Sophie Papadopoulos Jancy and her sister Christina don't cook Greek food for Greeks. They cook for people with names like Mohana, and Nielsen. Elenica Fasulada. This is the two Greeks in a small little town of Cairo and... And you just didn't give up being Greek? Nope. So, same old Greek. <laughs> well, I'm glad you are. Very so much good. American. <laughs> Very much American, but I'm Greek. Yeah, I love it. I love to be Greek, but I love to be American. Pat Buchanan called for his religious and cultural wars too late. The forces of homogenized culture are already in full retreat, and I expect to see their surrender flags any time now. The thing is, you can suppress ideas or forget them, but once you've tasted Sophie's gyros or mushu pork at the Yen Ching, you'll never go back to the melting pot. One or two. I always say I want two, but then I only eat one. I'll take both of them. <laughs> Did you believe that? Look at that guy. No wonder. Woo! You said I'll turn into a Greek. You are. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie.